let's now look at the post-Cold War changes that have led and that have influenced uh, change in uh, Japanese foreign policy objectives and the tools that uh, Japan has started to use in achieving its objectives uh, since the 1990s. I first would like to uh, take a look at the Japanese prime ministers since the 2000s, um, following the LDP's start of coalition governments, the emergence of coalition governments in the 1990s. The LDP returned uh, to power, and since then it has been in coalition government with Comreto. Uh, we have had a number of prime ministers from the Liberal Democratic Party, starting from the uh, Prime Minister Koizumi in the early 2000s, then was Prime Minister Abe, uh, his first term in office, followed by Prime Minister Fukuda, Prime Minister Aso, and then Prime Minister Abe returned in 2012. So what is essentially um, important to stress here, that after Prime Minister Koizumi, we had three administrations of Prime Ministers who stayed one year or less in office. Prime Minister Abe uh, was and became the longest serving Japanese Prime Minister. He has been followed by Prime Minister Suga, who you see on the slide, uh, who was the Chief Cabinet Secretary within the uh, Prime Minister Abe's administration. We had also the Democratic Party of Japan. Uh, for the first time, the opposition uh, made uh, in the 2000s, for the first time, there was another party that uh, entered uh, and the, uh, the government. And the Democrats essentially stayed in office for three years. Similarly to the administrations in the early 2000s, the administrations in the late 2000s of the Democratic Party of Japan uh, were shortly with Prime Minister Hatoyama, followed by Prime Minister Khan, and then followed by Prime Minister Noda. Each one of them also stayed in office for a year or less. As we discussed in the earlier parts of this uh, talk, uh, the Democrats, the views of the Democrats on foreign and security policy matters have converged and have been very close to the LDP in many ways, which has led to the general shift of the security debate in Japan towards the center right. In addition to that, also there has been a change in public opinion views with the growing acceptance, for example, of an expanded role for the self-defense forces beyond Japan in purely, however, non-military missions. At the same time, as mentioned earlier, most of the Japanese people continue to object to revision of Article 9, as we will discuss in a minute. If we look at the objectives of Japanese foreign policy, there has been an important change that we have to stress. During the Cold War, and as we have seen in the earlier parts of this talk, um, the guiding was the Yoshida Doctrine, named after Prime Minister Yoshida. So essentially that meant that Japan would keep a low profile in international affairs, in particular in security affairs, and instead focus on objectives such as economic de development, modernization, that Japan would pursue a foreign policy uh, where Japan would not be at the center of international stage. In other words, uh, no risk foreign policy. In line, what was also known as the one country pacifism conceptualization. Since the 1990s, uh, there is a new discourse that has emerged in Japan, the domestic political discourse, the discourse of a normal Japan. Um, Japan that is now and has to be more internationally engaged. Um, Japan that participates in various security missions. Japan is also one that is more diplomatically engaged. A normal Japan in line with the understanding um, of the meaning of Article 51 of the UN Charter, a normal Japan that also may um, employ the tools, military foreign policy tools, or hard power. Um, the shift of the security debate to, towards the center right, as a result 
of the emergence of the Democratic Party of Japan as the main opposition party, sharing a lot of views, a number of views with the LDP. And the shift in the public opinion, in other words, the fact that the public opinion had become more accepting and open to seeing Japan being internationally engaged, Japan playing a larger security role. These were important two drivers, domestic factors, essentially, that have also influence um, changes in Japanese foreign policy objectives. In other words, from a no-risk country, from a low profile, Japan becoming a normal Japan, which, however, does not go in contradiction with Japan's um, main principles of anti-militarism. In other words, a normal Japan does not mean that Japan will send troops abroad and fight wars, but a normal Japan means more Japan that is proactive in responding and in tackling various security challenges, which in the post-Cold War uh, period since the 1990s have become much more complex, much more challenging in the sense that they are no longer limited to territories of states or purely interstate conflicts, but they now cross borders, for example, similarly to the health crisis that we are now all experiencing, but also other challenges pointed out in various Japanese national security documents, for example, terrorism, um, issues related to space, cyber security, and other non-traditional security threats that require Japan to prepare and be able to respond to a number of non-traditional security challenges. With regard to the foreign policy tools, we also see correspondingly a change. Uh, the change is also driven by the fact that Japan has been experiencing economic and demographic constraints. In particular, aging society has been an important factor for Japan to reconsider its approaches to foreign policy. But most importantly, the changes in the regional environment in Asia, the rise of China, uncertainties about China's growing um, ambitions, regional ambitions, North Korean challenges for Japan, missile threats, nuclear issues that have been seen by Japan as clear and present danger. And finally, uncertainties about the U.S. defense commitments to Japan. Of course, the U.S.-Japan alliance remains strong. However, in recent years, there have been more and more concerns and debates within Japan with regard to the continuity of the U.S commitments to defending Japan and, more broadly, U.S. commitments to regional security in the Asia Pacific. So all that has necessitated and has led to change in Japan's understanding of what the most important foreign policy tools have to be in order to deal with this increasingly challenging and complex security environment. And so there has been a more um, focus on the combination of both soft and hard power um, in pursuing Japan's foreign policy objectives. Finally, uh, let's look at how Japanese national identity has been changing and how changes in Japanese national identity have also influenced Japan's foreign policy. Japan has been projecting a very ambiguous national identity. And that is based on historical factors, the fact that Japan is in Asia, but as some mm, perceptions exist that Japan is in Asia, but not of Asia, or primarily that was the case in the past, Japan geographically in Asia, but also there was a period of Japan's imperialism in Asia. So Japan conquering um, other Asian countries Japan also being a Western, because it was the first Asian country to modernize, to become a Western-like country in Asia. Japan constructing and projecting a pacifist identity during the Cold War, rooted in Article 9, but also in recent years, the more dominant discourse of ordinary or normal power. There has been also growing Japanese nationalism, one um, important reason for that has been the focus on promoting popular pride, that it's time for Japan to become more active internationally in line with the normal or active foreign policy for Japan. 
that Japan, since 1945, has been a model democracy, a peaceful nation, Japan promoting um, its peace identity. And now there is a growing uh, perception in Japan that Japan wants to be recognized more also, not only internationally, but also in Asia, where uh, there still remains serious problems and tensions, historical problems between Japan and its neighbors, in particular, South Korea and China. There has also been a generational change in Japanese uh, domestic politics. The younger politicians uh, who want to, who wish to end the so-called post-war regime uh, and uh, the history issue, which remains very much divisive in Japan's relations with its neighbors. And for the newer uh, generations of Japanese politicians who want to focus on the post-1945 identity of Japan, Japan's peaceful identity, Japan as a responsible and contributing nation to international security. And finally, of course, the narrative of Japan as a normal state that Japan now will be making proactive contribution to peace. In other words, not only one country pacifism, which was associated with economic giant political opinion, but now Japan pursuing a proactive foreign policy. Japan as a normal state narrative is also very much uh, linked to the issue of constitutional revision. And I would like to bring to your attention the fact that there is a domestic consensus in Japan, a uh, growing recognition that the self-defense forces should be officially recognized in Japan's constitution, both the public and most political parties or the largest political parties agree the right to national self-defense is there's also consensus in Japan. And finally, uh, there is an agreement that um, Japan should pursue more um, deeper engagement in international security missions, purely in non-combat logistical and humanitarian relief operations. Where the domestic division in Japan remains is what to do with Article 9. For example, public opinion is against revision of Article 9. Also, members of the former Democratic Party of Japan have been against, whereas we find mostly within the LDP, the politicians on the right of the center supporting the revision of Article 9. And the other point of contention domestically remains the right to collective self-defense, in particular support for the United States, where there still remains disagreement among the um, different parties, but also public opinion remains against it. So to conclude on Japan's national identity transformation, if we look at the changes from the Cold War and now since the 1990s, we are 2020, 21st century Japan, we see first change in the national security conceptualization of Japan, whereas during the Cold War, there was primarily a narrow focus on Japan's defense. There was this perception that Japan would rely on the United States for its security, and there was a strong soft power emphasis. We see that there is now in 21st century Japan an understanding of a widened national security conception. And now the narrative being that Japan not only relies on the United States, but Japan has to be and wants to be perceived as a reliable US ally and a responsible state, a state that contributes uh, in the area of international security from, in other words, a shift and change from a peace state identity to based on one country pacifism to a state of pursuing and constructing international state where the concept is now proactive pacifism as promoted by the former administration of Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. In other words, an increasing focus on both soft and hard power. And finally, to conclude, Japanese foreign policy evolution, uh, the fact that we see this growing drive and focus on more proactive security role. On the one hand, we have external forces, new security challenges, complex challenges that are not limited to territories of states that require growing international collaboration. Um, that are non-traditional in nature, but also traditional security challenges, balance of power changes in Asia, the rise of China, issues related to 
uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons. And then the domestic factors in Japan shift of the security debate towards the center right, domestic institutional changes, centralization of power uh, under the prime minister and the cabinet, the, power, the, the fact that the executive now has become more active. And finally, public opinion that also is willing to see a more proactive and internationally engaged Japan. In other words, we see an increasing focus on pursuing both, both soft and hard power in 21st century Japanese foreign policy. Thank you for your attention.